I'm going to be reviewing the Millet Everest GTX boots, one of three possible options for the most extreme adventures on the planet. Are these boots up to the challenge? In this video, I'm going to be reviewing for you all the technical details of the Malay Everest boots. Hi, my name's Aaron Linsdow. I'm a polar explorer and professional adventurer. Before I go on, if you wouldn't mind, please subscribing to support the channel. And also please leave a comment and let me know how I'm doing and give me some ideas for other videos. Thank you. So check these out. These things look like they were made by, I don't know, Ronald McDonald, perhaps. These Everest GTX boots are one of three types or three manufacturers of boots in the world that are recommended for going up Everest or Aconcagua maybe, but definitely Mount Vincent in Antarctica. These boots are rated down to minus 60 degrees Celsius or minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I've been in some pretty cold conditions in Antarctica and the Arctic. I mean, super cold, but minus 60 C or minus 76, whoa. So let's get right into the different features of this boot and why you might be interested in getting this. I'll put links below to all the products that I talk about in this video so you can check them out. So right away, when you look at this boot, this is what's called a triple boot. So what I'm going to do is open the boot and show you what it's like inside, just to give you an idea. So right away, you can see that this structure of the boot looks pretty floppy on top, where it's like, hey, uh, there, there's not much to this. But wait, I'll unzip this and show you what the structure is like. So the one of the nice things on this boot is that the Millet put Velcro on the zipper because what happens or what can happen in extreme conditions and tough locations is that zippers can fail. The original design of the Millet boot just had a zipper up the front and that was it. It does happen where, hey, your zipper pops and now you're like at 8,000 meters on Everest or Annapurna and now what are you going to do? So you can see here that they have not only a zipper with a zipper pull, but Velcro, ultra tough Velcro that runs all the way up the boot. In fact, it keeps snagging on my sweater here. So this zipper, I'll start, start with the outside. One of the keys is to make sure the zipper is as close from one side to the other as you can to protect the zipper. I have never had the zipper fail, but you never want to take that chance. So when you're doing this zipper action, make sure you pull it all the way up there and there you go. So the zipper goes almost all the way down the boot, which is very nice. So you can zip the zipper all the way up and make sure when you're zipping up the zipper, zipping up the zipper, yes, that you try and put the, the two sides of the boot as close as possible. That reduces strain on the zipper because at minus 50 degrees at 8,000 meters or Antarctica where it's again crazy cold, you don't want to put any more strain on your gear than absolutely necessary. So you zip this right up and goes all the way to the top and then you put this Velcro and run that all the way down. Now this does also come with two Velcro tabs here and down at the, uh, the ankle area and that roughly allows you to open up the zipper area where you can get it open. So that is a nice benefit. The next feature that's nice on these is the back calf drawstring where you can tighten up the drawstring on your calf and that way you can cramp it around right around your knee. I'll show you how this boot fits on me in just a little bit, but you can tighten this bungee around your calf and prevent the gaiter from drawing down on your legs. So that's a really nice feature. One thing I don't like is the fabric is pretty floppy up here. One thing I wish Malay would have done would be to have put some insulated fabric, some maybe hollow fill or something, whatever the latest fabric is in this part of the boot and it would have made it even warmer. However, their goal was warm enough but not so crazy where it's too much. 
This isn't a boot where you use gaiters at all. This is the gaiter on the boot. The next feature that you'll notice is this silver lining inside. This silver lining reflects back the heat into your leg, or at least it does in theory. At minus 50 degrees, I don't know how much heat there is, but the whole goal is to prevent you from freezing your feet off. And so let me open that up and you'll see that there's a silver lining on the tongue here, all the way up and down, and in the inside of the boot. Now, one of the bummers about this design is that over time, this flexing could possibly damage the boot. So, uh, yeah, I mean, or damage the foil. Now, that said, I've used this boot on Denali twice. And I've been in this boot, I think I've used it for over a month continuously. So, uh, that, that said, this has held up pretty well. So, these boots have over a month of trekking on them. I've been on Denali twice, been at minus 30 degrees. My feet were never cold, no matter how much it was blowing, snowing, high altitude or whatever. These have done great. And that, that's why I'm doing the review of them. So you can see in here inside, once you pull this down, and you do have to pull this down to get your foot on, to get the boot out, is you peel this away and you be careful. You don't want to strain that zipper because once you break it you're in real trouble and now you can see the inner structure of the boot now one thing that's very disappointing is these shoelaces are like old school laughable shoelaces i don't even know why such an expensive boot has cruddy shoelaces like this you can certainly get your own i haven't i've, I've dealt with them when you tie the 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 basic boot lace knot with a with a uh, surgeon's knot, eh, it generally stays together, but I think maybe one day I'll upgrade it. But when I, when I pull it tight, it seems to hold okay. They don't cinch down. So I, I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent one way or another. It feels kind of cheap for such an expensive boot, but they seem to work. And you'll notice all of these attachment points for the laces are all heavy studded rubber and plastic in there, so they're really connected well. Now that's another thing about this, is you cannot remove the boot from the gator assembly, but you can remove the inner liner from the boot. So you'll see here around the, I would say the lower shin part, you see this Velcro attachment, and this can stretch out all the way, or if need be, you can completely pull this out and you've got this crazy long setup here. And so let me show you here how this goes in and that goes in there around. It's got a long Velcro section and you need to put it at least to there, but you would have to have pretty thick calves for that to be a problem. So that is another part of the assembly of the boot is you get this part open and then it can completely flop around. Now you'll see on here, on both sides of the boot are very nice, large, if I can get them open, I never use them, pull straps where you can put your foot into the boot and pull up. So this uh, boot's designed that you can grab into it and get it on your foot when you're covered in three different socks. Also, the inner liner of the boot has a pull strap here as well so you can get that on and off so being oops being a double boot or a triple boot here that means that this boot has a liner that is not easy to remove as you're going to see in a minute you really need to undo your laces a long long way in order to get this liner out but this getting the liner out is really important because that allows you to get the liner out and uh, dry it out. Now, imagine trying to do this when you're weak at high altitude and you can see me struggling already. Now, I've got this covered in foot powder just to keep the, the boot inner portion dry and well-maintained. And that's something I definitely recommend for you as well. So before we get into the inner boot, I'll show you what the, the outer boot looks like. Let's see if I can get some light in there. And you can see inside, they actually use a carbon fiber sole in the, 
in this boot. So way down in there is a carbon fiber sole and that's what allows this boot to be a lot lighter than it actually looks. Now one thing I found on my boot that was a disappointment is that this seam here along the tongue of the boot started wearing out pretty quick. So even though it's sewn really well, it didn't look very positive. So what I did is I used some seam grip and globbed it along this inner side. But later I found out I should use Aqua Seal. It's basically the same product to Aqua Seal. It's just a little bit more manageable at room temperatures. Seam grip works well at negative whatever temperatures. So I used a little bit of the primer and the Aqua Seal to line this up. So that's the first weak point of this boot that you're going to want to just get ready to know that it could be a problem because you can see the stitching there. It was fine, but I saw it started to get damaged. You'll also notice inside here in the tongue area is actually foil or mylar inside of the fabric. And the idea is that this mylar reflects the heat back into you. And you'll see the inside of the boot has that mylar reflecting fabric all the way down on the lining with the prima loft and they have an arrow foam that's supposed to form to your foot. So you can see in there. Now, also this was another failure I found pretty quick with the boot is it's very difficult to see. Let me see if I can adjust it here. But inside is a piece of ballistic fabric that I used the aqua seal on and it was it's about let me take a measurement because this is an important factor for you is it's about uh, four inches tall and then it was I don't know about four inches wide so a square of ballistic nylon that's four by four you can see that ballistic nylon that I put in there and that protects the heel the heel started tearing up and digging out that fabric and exposing the mylar pretty quick. So that was a bummer on extremely expensive boots, but I think that's more of a function of I have to get a pretty wide boot. I bought the 47 and a half, which is extremely large. My foot is really wide. I wear a 11 and a half shoe, double wide. It's really irritating. These boots definitely do fit me, but they're absurdly big. So my foot moves up and down. I don't get any blisters in this. Even though my heel is loose, I've got another product to fix that. But that is the other immediate change you're going to want to do when you buy this boot is put the aqua seal on the tongue and then get a piece of heavy duty ballistic nylon and put it inside the heel area because the inner boot is made of a very tough rubberized material. And as it rubs up and down, it will tear out the inside of your boot pretty quick. So that's something you're going to want to do with this boot. Those are the only basic modifications I've made to the boot. However, in a moment, I'll talk to you about the crampon structure here. So you can see when the boots all opened up, kind of looks like a mess, but it works pretty well. Okay. And you can see actually, I did put some glue on, yeah, I forgot on this side of the tongue as well simply because I wasn't confident that that stitching was going to hold up. It just didn't look super inspiring. So I just coated that in Aqua Seal. And you can see after a month of wear, it's doing pretty well, maybe peeling back just a bit. So that's the structure of the inner boot or the, the outer boot. Sorry. So let me now show you the inner boot construction here. This thing Kind of looks pretty crazy. My toes only go to about here, which kind of stinks, but that's just the structure of the boot. You can see it's relatively natural and I've got a wider foot, so I had to get a much bigger boot. I really should have a 45 and a half, but there you go. So you'll see this rubber here is super, super tough. Just like the outside rubber of this boot, this stuff is arguably crampon proof. I've hit my crampons on this multiple times. I did accidentally put a hole somewhere. Let me find it here. Oh yeah. So this fabric is ultra tough, but I did snag a crampon hole. I need to put a little bit of aqua seal on that just to uh, seal that up. But this fabric on the upper part or not the top part, but the mid part of the boot 
handles pretty well in this bottom part. You could probably hit a crampon on it and uh, I would be pretty confident and I'll do that right now. Yep, you're not going to put a hole in your boot. You will. I snagged it and tore. Unfortunately, it didn't completely tear, but this part of the boot will never really get a hole in it. Uh, one other thing, you can see the structure of the sole here. It is a Vibram sole. Uh, you can see how much it's worn. Pretty much not at all for wearing it a month. So that is pretty good. Okay, let me get back to this part of the boot. Again, you can see where I put the foot powder, but you'll see also in the liner of the boot, there is that mylar to reflect the heat. You can see the lacing system. They also give you very nice big loops, which is nice for being able to handle this with gloves. And this has a quick lock system where you just simply pull this up, or let's see, what do we got here? I don't even remember. Yeah, I just pull the, pull the drawstring down, and then boom, it's pretty easy to do. So this drawstring system, or see it snags and stops there, but you can pull this down quite well, and it makes it very easy to handle. The loop on the back of the boot, the inner boot is very big, so you can use medium gloves with this. And let me loosen this up. This part of the boot also is very easy to handle with gloves. I did not put any uh, seam grip on the inside because I don't want any hard stuff against me. That'll tear me up. You can see, and it'll tear you up as well. You can see on the inside of the boot here, I didn't have to put anything in the heel area which is very nice. They also use Primaloft, not hollow fill or anything, but Primaloft, that's the best known synthetic fiber today. Uh, this is also called Aerotherm, and that thermal insulator right there, you want to mold this foot boot to your foot walking around. Don't, from, from what I understand, do not go to the ski store, have them put it on the heater and put it onto your foot. What you want to do is walk around and generate the heat from your foot and it will slowly shape to your foot. I've heard arguments both ways, oh, you should do that, but if you don't do it right and you mess this thing up, yeah, that could kind of stink. The bottom of this boot is super, super tough, and you'll see the seam along here has held up very well. Theoretically, you could walk around camp with this inner boot and it's so tough. Uh, in like Denali, you could probably do it. I would never do that simply because if I damage this inner boot, I've got nothing. So I use my uh, 40 below camp booties. Those are the best and that way I can march around and that's no big deal. So you can see the structure of the boot here. And I'll spin that around for you so you can see what it looks like. Cool, so there you go. So let me get a, to a couple points on here. Uh, the super fabric, the foil, the vibra mount of sole, the zipper does have the backup, which is very nice. Uh, one thing is when you're putting on this boot, do you put on the boot and then put your down suit or down insulated pants or your uh, mountain tools or whatever over it? Or do you put your insulative clothing inside of the boot? You don't want to crush the insulation of your clothing to, to get cold, but if you put your boot or your, your pants, sorry, over this boot and you snag your crampon, poof, feathers and insulation everywhere. So even though it doesn't seem as efficient, it's safer and generally smarter, safety is arguably more valuable, is to put your insulative pants inside of this boot. And that is, even though people complain that it's loose, this looseness actually allows you not to compress the insulation in your pants. So that is pretty slick. Okay, gator, boot liner, silver, gator, silver, crampon bars, oh, laminate, be careful. Oh yeah, and every day when you come to camp and you're all set, get the boot liner out, the inner boot, outside of the outer boot, and put this in your sleeping bag because this will allow you to warm up the boot the inner boot, it will also dry being in your sleeping bag as well. I've got a video on how to dry your clothing. This is one of them. This is very stiff. 
It is not comfortable to sleep in at all, but uh, there you go. That's just kind of the deal of that type of boot. But this being dry and warm in the morning is much more important than having a nice, comfortable sleeping evening. So a couple of the different failure points that people complain about. Again, the top of the gator is very floppy, but the trade is that it doesn't compress your pants. So that's good. The laces are probably the most embarrassing part of this. I don't know why they used it. Uh, the, uh, the Italian company, I'm sure there's a reason. Who knows? Maybe it doesn't get too tight and it's easier to come off. Let's see, the crampon clip point I'll get to in a moment. The footbed. Oh, yes. Okay, so there is a footbed in here. Forgot about that. And this footbed comes out. And the footbed has some sort of wool fabric on here. And it also has a mylar surface on here to reflect the heat back to you as well. It's surprising how well this works. When you get your boots, make sure that this is not creased. I have seen some people on the internet say, hey, this came all cranked up when it was inserted. So make sure that's not damaged because that could cause you a cold spot to damage your foot. And you can see inside there, eh, no problem. So yeah, I forgot about the inner liner of the boot on top of all that. So this is, I mean, this is just like a space boot without NASA there. So just something to watch for, crampon, heel rub spot, ballistic glue, okay. So what about the weight of the boots before I get to the crampon business here? Let me fire up my handy dandy scale. And we'll put one boot on here. And this boot weighs three pounds and seven ounces. So yeah, that is literally an ankle weight on your foot. Now, interestingly, let me compare that to the Barunse double boot. The Barunse double boot is three pounds, seven ounces. And the Malay is three pounds, seven ounces. So literally my Barunse boots and my Malays are the same weight. That almost makes me want to use the Malays every time I need a double boot, but I don't want to wear these out because they're so expensive that I want to treat them a little bit delicately. Yeah, that's so that's an interesting concept. I've used this boot down to minus 18. My feet were plenty warm. I've used on this on Denali down to minus 35 or whatever and plenty warm. It, however, if you use a double boot on Denali, chances are you're going to need an overboot or, or a Joel Attaway's 40 below overboot over this on top of Denali at 17,000 foot camp. So I would say a double boot by itself is going to be risky and inadequate for Denali. You could take this boot all the way up Denali. So wait for weight. <laughs> I actually vote for this boot because this, my double Barunces, need a outdoor or outer shell to get all the way to the summit. Interesting point to consider. So let's see, uh, measurements. Yeah, let me get some measurements here real quick. Get my tape measure here. So this boot total is 19 inches tall with the gator. So that sucker is really, really tall. The boot length is, if you can see it there, I'm struggling just a bit. Can't even see my own measurement. Oh, 14 inches, crazy, crazy long. So you'll see, next we'll get into the gate or the, uh, the crampons. One of the things people don't like about the crampon fitment is that the heel is really too big for most crampons. I use the Gravel crampons, these one, two, four, five, six. So these are the G12s, you don't, uh, this is not an extreme vertical crampon, but the heel attachment, let's use the other one. The heel attachment is, the heel is just too big for my crampons, even though it seems to fit there. Let me adjust my crampons and I'll show you the issue. Now you're going to need to get crampon extender bars for your crampons simply because this boot is ridiculously huge. So you're going to have to put this crampon at the farthest point and they still barely fit on here. So this is my left 
boot. Just to show you how awkward to handle these things really are, it's pretty crazy. So let me just Velcro this up. And yes, you will struggle like this on the mountain or wherever you're going. And just to show you what the experience is really like. Okay, so to get this cramp on on here, you can see that it grabs the toe just fine. And I have the cramp on extended all the way out and it just doesn't reach barely. It just, I have to force this on and it's not super confidence inspiring. I'm going to take a blade and cut just a tiny bit of this corner of the, the boot out. It's kind of scary because they're so expensive, but this is a complaint that everybody's talked about. So if you have a, a 45, 46, 47, you're going to need to buy the extender bar for your crampon. Also, when you put this on, it's hard to get over the bar. Now, I need to loosen my crampon all the way. That way it'll actually click on there just to show you again. This is something you want to do before you leave is be very confident that it fits. Okay, ready? Ooh, no click. That's right, there was no click when you put the crampon on. Compare that to my Cube boots, the uh, Sportiva boots, when I put the crampon on those, let me give you an impression of how it really should sound. Okay, one moment, okay. And the boot will fit right in here and it fits very nicely. And we'll listen to this wonderful sound of positivity. Hear that? Let's try it again. Okay, compare that to the Malay. Nothing happens. It doesn't super lock in and that's because the heel really sticks out away from the, uh, the crampon lock point. So you have to be very attentive to make sure that this stays all the way locked because if that flops open, you're going to be in real, real trouble. So let me show you just how big this boot is here. All right. I'm not exactly putting this on right. Hang on. And if you think you're struggling now, wait till you try this on a high, high mountain. Okay, and then we'll put that in there. <laughs> okay, so sometimes depending on how I want to spin this thing. All right, so you can see that the Gravel, oh, I've got it too loose. Hey, 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 something to watch for. You've got to make sure that the strap is completely flat on your boot as well because it's super, super easy to snag your cramp on. Now you don't want to over crank it because you don't want to break this point. These boots definitely want a toe bar. You do not want a rubber over uh, connection on this boot because it's not going to be that positive. The toe bar is absolutely positive. It won't come off your boot. That said, the heel attachment on your cramp on is not super positive. So you're utterly dependent on this strap to hold. So that is a potential failing point versus this. Even if my strap completely dies, it'd be pretty tough for my cramp on to come off on my La Sportiva cubes. So that is another downside. Also, anytime I put this thing on, I always loop this through just to control my uh, strap there. And you, you got to fill around and figure it out. So when you're walking along, you don't have this strap hanging around, but you can see just how big and voluminous this boot is compared to my single boot here. Just to give you a comparison point of how much bigger this thing really, really is. It's pretty crazy. See how much strap is left there? I mean, there is no comparison whatsoever. So the strap remaining off the single boot versus the triple boot is pretty crazy. So that, that's definitely 
I would say a bummer of the design of the boot, but there's a lot of insulation there. So just know that this strap is a critical can't fail piece of equipment because if this strap dies and you're walking along, this is not positively snapped on there at all. And what I do is when I'm putting the boot on, I always leave the liner in just because it's much easier to put the boot on and it doesn't put any pressure. Also, when I'm pushing on the heel, I don't want the fabric under there because I don't want to damage it. So you do have to be a little bit attentive about that. Okay, so you always got to get your socks and everything pulled up. And in the inner liner of the boot, you get this all pulled and this lock system works very, very well. It's easy to manage, at least in general. Uh, let's see. And you can tighten it up pretty well. So that fits your foot very, very well there. And then I get the laces and just kind of stuff them in just to the side. And then I put the tongue of the boot in. And the tongue is a major assembly. This thing is pretty crazy tough. I begin just slowly snugging them down, pulling them out here until I can get that. And there isn't a second lace point up here, so you really just tie this across. I'd use a surgeon's knot just to make sure it stays fine. Tighten this up, and I do, once I get this set and it feels comfortable, right now it's loose because I only have one sock on, I do double knot this because of the looseness of those laces and once I get that set up then I get come around and put the strap in here and you'll notice uh, there you go now the boots really really loose on me at the moment because I don't have my socks in there as I said so my foot would wobble around my toes are wiggling because it's only a single layer so it's not too bad and then I bring up the boot here and I put the zipper as close as I can and just begin easily pulling this up. If you're having to pull hard on that zipper to close it up, rethink what you're doing because you damage that zipper and you're in trouble. And I just gently run the zipper up there, get it all the way to the top and I get the zipper pull and I tuck it inside of here to make sure it doesn't get snagged. And then you just roll down the Velcro just like that. So it is pretty easy to do. Now, I'm going to show you what you do is I always put the, the boots on first before putting the crampons because you're flipping and fumbling around. If you have the crampon first, it's very easy to stab yourself. So this is a bit of a process. And you can see I have to pull... And you think this is hard here. Try this on the top of Denali. Ah. Yeah, not super confident. Okay. It comes around there. And again like this. Flips in here. And boom. And I'd finish it off with my traditional knot like this. And that way generally doesn't come apart. And there you go, that boot is fully assembled. Sure feels loose on me, wish I would have got the 46 nowadays. But uh, there you go, our 46 and a half. And that, that is the Malay boot, completely on your foot. So there you go, that is the Malay Everest GTX boot. And get the cramp on off there, and it is takes a little bit of a pull. To get that thing popped off there, it's not that easy. These are incredible boots. They are incredibly expensive, but they will definitely get the job done. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of too many people getting frostbite with this boot. Uh, with the Scarpas, I've heard a few stories. With the Olympus Mons, I don't think so, but with Scarpas, uh, sketchy. But I bought these knowing that, hey, these come highly, highly recommended. And you can even see a couple of the crampon scars in the boot. Those are legit crampon scars where I stabbed myself and it didn't go through my boot at all, which was very nice. 
My name is Aaron Linsdow. I'm a polar explorer and professional adventurer. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and comment on the video and subscribe to my channel. Also, please support me on Venmo, PayPal, and Patreon. Thank you very much for watching.